Yeah. And I think a huge thing, I think everybody should understand too, that because, because it's such a staple in volleyball players workouts, squatting, you know, not everybody squats the same. So I hope people understand and realize that mm-hmm. not everybody has to set up the same. Not everybody has to set up their feet pointing straight forward or whatever it is. Right. So I, I just, I hope people understand that it all depends on your body type and your levers and how you're anatomically structured. Right? You could have short legs with a long torso, or you could have short tibia, long femurs, long torso, and you're probably falling back a lot and unless you change uh, how you set up your feet. So uh, you, people just really explore, right? Set up in different positions, how, how wide you want to get, how much you want to turn your toes out. or So it, everybody just has to explore that and make sure that's best for them. Um, yeah, so it just comes down to what what you can get into based on, one, um, your lovers, lovers as in lengths of your bones. Um, and then two, your mobility too, right? Like sometimes you can't get into it. Um, and if you guys want to see a very interesting squat, go look at LeBron James's squat guys. Like his squat is like, if, if you're just a meathead or just showing up at the gym, like you gotta do this, you gotta squat all the way down feet. Point, then like you would look at LeBron and just think, man, this guy is doing it all wrong. He has the most atrocious looking squat. But that's what works for him. I mean, he's like, his feet are really wide out, toes turned out. His squat, is, he's going down maybe like two feet. Uh, it, it just looks really strange, but that's what works for him. So, and I have a girl um, the, doing track at BYU right now. And um, she squats actually with her feet completely together. And oh. she can go straight down, straight up. And she looks perfect. Her back is nice and flat. She doesn't lose balance whatsoever she's extremely comfortable and it was weird because i looked at her and i said man you squat your feet completely together and she's just like wait nobody else does that <laughs> like she, she looked at me i thought i was weird so yeah it, it was really funny because that's impressive you know not because she just had perfect uh symmetry and all her bone like lovers so she's able to be like compact and do that yeah. so it's just fighting that she she thought that we were crazy that we didn't yeah. squat like <laughs> Yeah. Does she have really narrow hips and uh, short femur? Uh, yeah, her femur and her tibia are like pretty similar length. Um, okay. Her torso is decently, I uh, relatively long but even, and yeah, her hips are pretty narrow. Her shoulder mobility is great, so she just looks like she's holding it right back here, and she's just like sitting down. She's nice and tall, standing up, and it was pretty crazy for me to see that. And she said her. <laughs> Strength coaches at BYU were freaking out too when they saw her do it. <laughs> yeah. It was fun. Uh, one of the guys with the best quads ever, Tom Platt's bodybuilder, was a narrow stance squatter. And you should look wow. him up. He's got monster quads, but he squatted narrow stance as a bodybuilder. Um, wow. But yeah, that would, that would probably yeah. scare a lot of the squat police out there on the internet. Um, yeah. Not, not going ass to grass. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. For sure. You know, what I do notice with actually more of my female clients is I, I, I'm curious what the ball and joint looks like at the the head of the femur where it attaches to, I'm oh, sorry, the head of the yeah, femur bone where it attaches to the pelvis. I noticed that the ones I've worked with have to open up a little bit more. So not only wider stance, even though they are more mobile, um, they I feel like I have to have them actually rotate their knees more, get their toes point out just to get comfortably in a bottom bottom position compared to my male athletes. So I wonder if it's the the width of their hips. Um, So I'm curious what your, what your observation has been with the squat difference between male and female um, athletes that you've worked with. Hmm. So for me, I think, uh, I've, I've seen most of it. I haven't seen it as um, like their hips, like how wide and how uh, narrow they are. I actually see is more, the first thing I look at is actually their, their femur and um, their torso. So mm-hmm. man, I wish I'm actually going to get a whiteboard in my house so I can start like writing and teaching things on Instagram. Oh, heck but, yeah. So just like drawing out body levers. So man, let's say I don't have anything around me right now, but so let's say somebody that has a femur, a uh, femur here, right? And let's say it's really long, like this long. And their tibia is maybe this length, right? And their torso is just about right here. 
So if you th really think about it, somebody that has this long of a femur in their bodies back here, let's say if I do this. So when they go hold weight on their back, whatever, that's a lot of weight, one, with their body being centered back there and then weight on them. So naturally, if they're just squatting with their feet, about hip width apart, shoulder width apart, they're, they're probably going to fall back, right? And so people start thinking, okay, well, maybe they need to elevate their heels or maybe this, they don't have hip mobility. And then I've seen athletes like that who have great, great hip mobility. So it's not the hip mobility issue. So it really comes down to how can I take advantage of this long, oh, it's perfect, of this long femur, right? And make it shorter. So what happens is you can turn your legs out because now look, mm -hmm. it gets shorter. So if yeah. this was my hip joint, so it's really like it gets shorter, and now I'm a little. I would be a little bit more upright to go through those squats. So mm -hmm. I would inch it out. You know, I wouldn't tell people go really wide because if they go really wide, it just uh, compromises the squat just a little bit. But um, yeah, I always look at their their torso and their femur and how how long they're compared to the rest of their body or relatively. So really, I mean, I don't just look at that. I look at all of that in general. Um, yeah and see how well we can just manipulate to make it a little bit better. Yeah. So, but I, I do think there's probably some, uh, a really good benefit in everybody looking into different position setups for hip widths too. Right? I haven't looked too much into that, but for me specifically, that's what I've looked at. Like how can I manipulate so that I'm making sure our center of mass stays right in the middle where it needs to be. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, there's always other different instances like shorter femurs, long torso or whatever so they have to go low bar so it it just really depends everyone's a little bit different in that sense but that's how i've kind of seen it and made changes if i saw uh recognize something yeah yeah that makes a lot of sense to kind of get the bar back over the center of gravity and actually just thinking about one athlete i've worked with in particular what well, one test that i like to do is i have them lie on the back and i have them push against my chest just for some light resistance at different angles and some people you know, like Impingement can be looked at two ways. One is mechanical impingement, where the joints are just physically being pinched, sharp pain that's being, you know, the, the path is being closed, or just a structural impingement where maybe the groove due to scar tissue or just you're born that way, it can't move in a certain way. So, how do we open things up so it can get and can slide easily? And so, two athletes, one had a wider stance because when we went narrow, we just physically, even if I try to push on it, do like a, an active stretch with her, it just wouldn't move, right? If it, if it was tightness, I can move it with assistance. Another one with what you're thinking of, uh, I think I, she does have a, she must have a longer femur then because when she does her full approach, her ground contact, contact time is a lot longer. So I'm thinking if you have a shorter tibia, longer femur, you probably have a shorter Achilles. Uh, less elastic ability, more ground contact time, more of a strength jumper, and she's super strong. We can load heavy weights. Um, so actually, for her, that's probably why it worked better for her is longer femur, get her out more, center her. That makes she sense. a pretty good jumper? Um, not naturally. It's, it's required. She's responded a lot more to strength. There, we went, we tested two phases. One was more reactive because she's a little bit thicker body type like she, her ankles and wrists are a little bit thicker so my usually response is like, okay get them faster if they're she can handle heavy loads but she just got faster but it wasn't translating to higher vertical so we went back to more strength work um and s ironically slowed down her movements just a little bit so she can get into a deeper position and utilize more hip extension and some some jumping mechanics that she actually, we actually got better results that way. Um, but I wonder if it's because the longer femur, shorter tibia, um, it's, it just, yeah, you're just, you're just gonna naturally be, the time it takes to extend with a longer femur is gonna be so much longer um, for those. Like if you look at so many of the basketball players, they have that short calf muscle, but if you look at the length of the tibia, it's, it's super long. So that's why they don't need to bend down as much and then they can just pop up, right? Yep. They have yeah. so much elastic energy in that Achilles. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, with the girl with the long femur, you know, she, that also means more impulse. You know, she has more time to develop power or mm -hmm. strength. So mm -hmm. that's always, I think that was always a little bit harder too with some athletes. Like, 
if their their femur or whatever you know is longer then it's always a little bit tricky to figure out what's best for them what's going to work for them so yeah. yeah so i can understand what you mean by that i've definitely had some athletes in that sense uh, and we you know we saw a lot of uh, results with it too um and a lot of it too is it, athletes out there um they have to understand that um you know you have to learn how to load before you can explode so like mm-hmm. if if you're really strong coming out of a position um it's not a whole lot of benefit unless you're also really strong going being able to tell your body to go down fast and hit the brakes Mm -hmm. because the better you can hit the brakes and get out then you know the more power that you you can develop um the more springy you can become so um you know otherwise you're just kind of like this runaway train that doesn't know how to hit the brakes so um, that's a huge thing too if some athletes out there looking to jump higher they need to learn how to load before they explode they need to figure out how they can be stable, be extent, be strong through a, you know, eccentric training and then be able to get out. Cause a lot of times athletes will, you know, blockers, especially say on the beach, what I'm seeing sometimes um, with our, even our best blockers, our best women and men that they, um, um, they, especially college athletes that when they drop down low and get out, the ones that want to drop, the ones that can drop, hit the brakes and get out. You can tell, you can tell just by looking at them. The ones that can't quite, they start dropping, and you see their knees kind of not even buckle, just kind of shake a little bit. Mm-hmm. And they take a little bit longer time to get out. And it looks like when they start to try to hit the brake and get out, you can see the brake happening. And then they still drop a little bit. Their hips mm-hmm. drop a little, and then they get out. Yeah. So what that says is eccentric. They're, they're not quite there yet. But can you imagine if they were able to just, boom, stop and get out? Like, that's what we're looking for. So yeah. just another thing there. Um, <laughs> we're going off in tangents. I was going to say something else. Um, yeah, just kind of throwing information out there for viewers, you know, like uh, yeah. what time we have. But yeah, I think that's a huge thing too. So yeah, I mean, back to squats. I forgot what we were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Actually, that's the two most common questions I get whenever we do squats, right? And, uh, the, the common gym motto is don't let your knees go past your toes. And majority of the time, I actually feel like most of my athletes need to do that because one, it's to keep the torso upright. Most people are going to have to let their knees go past those, even on a back squat, not even just on a front squat, load the quads a little bit more. And then they go, is it, I thought you're supposed to never let your knees go past your toes. I was like, yeah, in specific body types, but yours is not the one. And I try to explain, like I said, educate the the client. So they have greater volume and understand, okay, this, this is not going to hurt me. Second question I always get is most people are going to, especially young athletes that are still learning their bodies are only going to go down a couple of inches when they do a standing jump. And I'm telling them, and I try to train them to go a little bit lower to get more muscle activation because there's no momentum. There's no speed component. It's all muscular. It's all uh, just force generated from standing position. And then when they first do it, they always jump lower because they cannot isometrically contract at the right angle to stop it and then rebound off they go low and then they go down that delay and the Mm -hmm. delay usually happens with like a weird there's like a delayed arm swing because their body knows that so they squat down and then that second drop that's when they bring their arms down and they go up and they all say i'm jumping lower it's like you know this this is what we want to get this is the range of motion we want to achieve now let's strengthen it from that position and i guarantee you Next month, we're going to be jumping two inches higher if you just trust the process and trust the, the range of motion. Yep, exactly. So just getting strong through a wide range of motion. Um, I mean, a lot, a lot of people will go their whole lives not ever seeing a force plate, seeing what it looks like. Um, but, you know, all, all, pretty much all across professional sports, for sure, in the volleyball world, obviously I've been around in the USA gym. Um, you know, when you're – you're having some of these force plates and you have them to jump, let's say like a counter movement jump. So mm-hmm. hands on the waist, standing tall. Okay. Three, two, one, boom. They drop down and jump straight up. So you see this little line that let's say if nothing's happened, it's just a straight line right on the screen. So when they drop, um, you can see a little dip right in force. Cause it is reading that there's uh, not a whole lot of body weight right there going on. And then the moment you hit the brakes, you see a lot of force come up, right? The higher the force and, um, and how narrow this little peak is, it really tells you how one how hard they hit it, so how it goes, and how fast they hit it and got you know got out, which is a little uh, 
just that little window, I would have to draw it out sometime. And then once they start jumping, um, you'll see a little spike, right? During the concentric phase. And actually you see a dip and a second spike. Mm. So that first spike is pretty much that, that bottom end portion, right? That, that when they're really getting out of that position. So that's why it's really important to develop strength and power through a, a wide range, right? Like you said, like maybe they're in, in that bottom position, they aren't really fast out of it because they refuse to get that low, let's say, or try to work that uh, range in the weight room over time. Then that second portion is to me where we're most mechanically advantageous to, to be at our, our, let's say, top end speed or be the most explosive or fast out of it, like during that quarter squat phase. Mm -hmm. So that's that second one that goes even higher. But the, the thing about, um, the the quarter squat and on until you're fully extended you're you're producing forces the quickest right so it's going really fast at the end the bottom portion maybe not as fast but you're producing the most force mm -hmm. at that bottom position so right so it's how much force you can produce in a short window of time so if you think about that bottom portion is really important to, because that's the kickstart right so it's really important for athletes to understand that there's there's two there's gonna be two little uh, dips in that little graph where you're looking at a force plate when people are jumping. So just kind of a fun fact there. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I, I like to use anime analogies for some of my younger younger uh, athletes, where uh, Naruto, whatever the with the most recent one that people are watching, it's that special move where you kind of jump really hard against the wall and they load and they charge so that they can spring off if that <laughs> yeah. wall is not stable and that's my ability to I, that's why isometrics like a really good exercise you get the home for the listeners even you can do with weight I, body weight's always a good start you squat down as quickly as you can and stop on a dime hold it for three seconds and then stand up you know, doing that with weight right increasing the acceleration or the force of the acceleration if that wall is not solid, they, they cannot push off as hard, right? If they go here as marshmallow, then they're just going to keep going past and there's no rebound force in that effect. Yeah. So you got to be like, got to be like Goku or Naruto, whoever you guys listen to. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That's funny. That's a, that's a really good depiction. Like I can just, I can just picture all that, which is really funny. Yeah. And yeah. unfortunately now they have a volleyball anime. So there's no, there's no like magical analogy. You just see it <laughs> on the court. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which is really cool. A lot of people are into that. Mm -hmm. It's pretty awesome. Have you watched, have you watched uh, Haiku yet? Yeah.